Thank you for joining me for this study in the book of Numbers. Uh, it's session three in Lifeway Explore the Bible. The title of the lesson is God Requires, and the summary statement is God requires the leaders of his people to follow him fully. It's from Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 to 13. I like the suggestion on how to start the lesson that was found at blog.lifeway backslash explore the Bible. It's the story about a Amazon driver that's delivering a package and he follows these very clear details about how he's supposed to leave the package. It's a fun uh, story. It's also, you can find it on video and it's a good way, I think, to introduce the lesson. After the video is shown to the class, I, I ask, would you have followed these directions? And if you would, why would you follow these directions? Or if you wouldn't, tell me, why would you not follow these directions? How, how is it that you determine whether you're going to follow someone's directions or not? And that gives an opportunity to introduce the subject. The lesson today is about God giving clear instructions to Moses. And Moses pays a price for not fully following God's commands. Now, if you'll notice the summary lesson statement again, God requires the leaders of his people to follow him fully. This word require means commands. He compels the leaders of his people to follow. And following is describing a, a way of life. And they are to follow God fully. That is totally, wholly, completely. The title is interesting to me, God Requires. But you could finish that title by saying God requires leaders to be followers. And we're going to see that of all of the characteristics and all of the requirements of a leader, the fundamental quality, the fundamental characteristic of a leader that's following God and having an influence for others is he must be someone who follows God. The Bible's full of requirements on leadership. The clearest, I suppose, is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, where it describes pastors and deacons and all of those characteristics that fit in pastoral leadership. And why does the Bible go into such detail when it comes to describing the leaders of God's people? It's because leadership has such an influence and such an impact on those who follow. In work, in church, in home, in nation, what follows is significantly impact by the kind of leaders you find in those places. So there's, when you look at this lesson, it just seems to me there are two observations, and that is God's leaders are first followers. And the second is God's leaders are expected to follow fully. Now the passage that is before us, the way that they break it up is seems to be a description of what's happening in the passage. For example, the first point is the timing. And uh, what I say to the class is, let's use these verses, verses one to five, to just paint the picture and think our way back into the situation that's happening so we can understand what follows in the rest of the passage. So as I go through the passage, I may stop and give an explanation of various things or ask questions about things. You know that teaching is as much an art as it is a skill. And so lots of times what's happening and that makes your class really dynamic is you're responding to something that someone says or someone questions and those kinds of things. But what I'm trying to do in this, I'm trying to paint a picture. I'm trying to help them understand this scene that's taking place. This is the timing. It says in verse one, the entire Israelite community entered the wilderness of Zin in the first month and they settled in Kadesh. Now we know from other passages of scripture, this is 40 years later. This is the beginning, of course, of the Jewish year. This is when they, they were at the promised land ready to go in last time at, on the first of the month. This is when they're celebrating the Passover. And it gives this, Miriam died and was buried. 
Miriam was a magnificent woman. Uh, Moses, in one sense, could be said to be alive because of Marion's watch care over him when he was a baby floating in that basket. You know the story of how he approached the princess and asked if she could find a, a nursemaid for the baby. Uh, she uh, did have her problems. She didn't like the fact that Moses married a Cushite. Uh, she was a little bit complaining about Moses' leadership. Uh, but Mo Miriam, by and large, was a, a, a magnificent person, and she's the only woman that's recorded uh, about her death in all of these stories here in the Exodus event. Uh, Moses, no doubt, loved his big sister, and there's, there's great emotion that must be behind that statement. Miriam died and was buried. That's helping us understand something of the scene that's taking place. There was no water for the community, so they assembled against Moses and Aaron. The most frequent word you'll find in this passage is the word water. And this water sets up the picture of this conflict, and it reveals the heart and the lack of faith in these people. The interesting thing is this issue of water is going to result in a resolution, and the resolution is going to be a rock. Interesting. There was no water in the community, so they assembled against Moses and Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses. The word quarreled here is a word that describes vigorous struggle. If you were to watch uh, people wrestling, that would describe this word quarrel. But of course, they're not physically struggling with Moses, but they are verbally struggling. This, this is no mild disagreement. They're not complaining. They are in full volt rebellion against Moses. If you've ever seen a, on a TV report of uh, parents who are upset at a school board meeting where they're standing up and they're shouting and they're accusing and they're pointing and gesturing, when you see something of that kind of news report about a crowd that is rebelling against something, this is what's happening. It's a very frightening scene. Imagine hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who are in this state of mind and Moses and Aaron are right there in the midst of them. And they say to Moses and Aaron, if only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. We wish we were dead. And one of the things you'll notice about grumblers is they exaggerate. They magnify. They blame instead of taking responsibility. Verse 4, why have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Now, I have a question for you. Why were they there? Who actually brought the people of Israel back to this location after 40 years? Well, obviously, it's God. They're just following the cloud as God directs the people. Verse 5, why have you led us up from Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain, figs, vines, and pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Now, if... The word follow in our summary statement means a way of life. And if the word fully means totally, wholly, completely, then it applies to the hard times. And these are the hard times for Moses. We've, we've tried to talk through what must it be like. Moses, on one hand, he's experienced the death of his beloved sister. And so he's grieving that. On the other hand, here are these people complaining and accusing him of failed leadership, and they're accusing him of things that simply are not true. And they are very angry with him. This is a hard time. But, but what, what does following God look like when you're in the hard times? Can you answer that for me? Can you give me some idea? What does following God fully look like in the hard times because we're all going to be there and that was a an opportunity to give some discussion and to think about this lesson as it prepares us for what comes next the second point is the directions this is another de description of the text that's taking place and um, if uh, following god fully means 
to act in accordance to his directions, to his commands. Following God fully means to act in accordance to God's directions. A good follower takes directions well and gets in line with the program. And we're going to see if Moses is a good follower. So we're going to read through this. And what is it that Moses and Aaron do that's right? It's a good decision. Verse 6, then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting. They fell face down. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, take the staff and assemble the community. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch and it will yield its water. You will bring out water for them from the rock and provide drink for the community and the livestock. So what is it that Moses and Aaron do right? And you can name those things. So the directions from God are very clear. He's to speak to the rock. Now, I, wanna, I would assume that Moses may be thinking, wouldn't it better be better to strike the rock? And so one of the things that I want to use to prepare the class for what's going to happen next is... To try to draw this contrast between Moses has had this experience before, but he struck the rock. But this is a very different instruction. This time, he's to speak to the rock. And out of the rock, just speaking to it, water is going to come forth. Sometimes God's instructions to us appear unreasonable. Can you think of any other of uh, God's instructions to us that he wants us to follow fully but they just appear to be unreasonable. I suggested to the class, what about the instructions that we're to forgive someone 70 times seven? Does that not seem to be unreasonable at times? And in my class, that really generated some discussion. I came to see people really feel this issue of forgiveness and having been hurt by others and God asking us to forgive them again and again. And we had to discuss what that passage meant. I, I, I introduced another concept. What about this idea of agape love? You know, that sometimes seems to be an unreasonable request that God has for us. But if we're going to be, but, but we're going to, if we're going to be fully following God, he expects us to love in that kind of selfless way even if we receive nothing back in return. And so I, I prepared, I was trying to prepare the class for that, uh, what was coming next. This, this is very clear what God says to Moses, but I can't help but think that it appears to be um, uh, unreasonable. Now the second, the third point of the class is the frustration. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had commanded him. Now that staff is debated by the scholars. Is it Moses' staff? Is it Aaron's staff? There are good scholars who fall on either side of that. But the point that it represents is the power of God and the presence of God. That, that staff, if it's Moses' staff, has been associated with water a lot. I mean, he used it to demonstrate the dividing of the Red Sea. He used it to bring water out of a rock, and here it is again. And it's, it's just this symbol of the presence and the power of God, and they're going to see it displayed in a very tremendous way when Moses is supposed to just speak, and water will come from the rock. It says in verse 10, Moses and Aaron assembled, assemb summoned the assembly in front of the rock. So far, so good. And Moses said... Okay, to them. Now, here's where he begins to not follow fully. God didn't give him the word to say anything to the people. He's supposed to speak not to the people, but to the rock. And nowhere in the passage when you read it, do you find that God's angry with the people. But Moses is certainly angry with them. 
He said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock for you? The word bring there is causative. It means, do we have to deliver again? Moses is including himself as one of the ones that's going to deliver the people of God instead of pointing to the Lord. In verse 11, then Moses raised his hand. He struck the rock twice with his staff so that abundant water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. Now the question, why did he strike the rock twice? There's nothing in the text that indicates why he struck the rock top twice. You can find some very creative explanations by uh, preachers and commentators about he struck the rock once and, and uh, then he's just supposed to speak to that. And this rock is representative of Christ. Paul, Paul mentions that in 1 Corinthians 10. But in terms of this text, it really doesn't say anything. About the only thing that that detail really gives us, is, as far as I'm aware of, is it re reveals how very angry Moses is with the people. After we've gone through the text, I asked the class, why is Moses frustrated? And I, I just wanted to list the reasons they could give, and there are many reasons why Moses is frustrated with these people. And I said, all of us could understand why Moses has just had it with these people. But look at this list again. Couldn't this list, the things they've mentioned, why Moses is frustrated with the people, couldn't this list also be an explanation why he shouldn't be frustrated with the people? I mean, one of the things is he's been dealing with these people for 40 years, and, and it's as if he's finally gotten his fill with them. Well, my question to that is, if he's been dealing with them for 40 years, he knows what they're like. This shouldn't catch him by surprise. These people, once they get uncomfortable about something, and, and being without water is more than being uncomfortable, they don't come with, to God with faith. They come with unbelief. These people are acting the very way they've always acted for 40 years. And so I would suggest to you, instead of that being a reason to explain his frustration, it ought to have been a reason for why he should not have been frustrated. These people are acting the way they're supposed to act. And so you can go through that kind of list. So, so if, you, if you agree with me, what's the problem? Where's his focus? Well, his focus is on himself. But you look at that lesson statement again. God requires the leaders of his people to follow him fully. There's a lifestyle involved. There's a wholeness and a totality and a completeness when it comes to following God. It's God that should have been Moses' greatest concern. He should have been doing what God called him to do. The job, you, he should have been doing the job he's asked to do, not the job he wanted to do. So the people are frustrated. And then the last section that's descriptive is the fallout. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me to demonstrate my holiness in uh, the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land I have given you. These are the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and he demonstrated his holiness to him. What was Moses' wrongdoing. God tells, God gives him the reason for why he's going to be punished and not taken in and doesn't get to go into the promised land. And he says, you didn't trust me to demonstrate my holiness. He prevents the people of God from experiencing the full power and might of God. His actions cause them to miss out on the real significance and power of this miracle. They needed God, not Moses. When they get into the promised land, what they need to be convinced of is this is a God that is so powerful, he can bring water from a rock 
by speaking to it. Whether we have Moses or not, this, this is a God that we can depend on. Do you see how that prepares them? And Moses, Moses diminished God before the people with his anger and with his actions. And so, so that was taken very seriously to dishonor God. And it cost Moses the privilege of going into the promised land. Just one observation about the text. When you're reading Hebrew narrative, sometimes it seems to be repetitive and wordy. It will give us a description of something like Moses's, uh, God's description to Moses, what he's supposed to do. And then it will re almost like repeat it again. And it just seems to be uh, so much detail. What is, what is the writer intending for us to catch from that? What's the point? Either God's word was followed fully or they failed to do so. And this is what's being stressed in this lesson. God expects his people, leader or follower, to follow him fully. And this is a lesson for us today. God wants us to not make it up as we go, to change things, to fit our own perspective. If God says to forgive 70 times seven, and it may seem unreasonable, but God intends for us to be non-vengeful, forgiving people. The way I close the lesson is I, I told them that I have a friend that I'm concerned about that uh, was a, a fully devoted follower of Jesus, pastor to church, and uh, the church broke his heart. And consequently, he's uh, fallen out of being consistent and faithful to church. And my heart, my heart is concerned for him. And so I asked him, how could I help this friend of mine who's struggling to be faithful to return to being uh, a believer who, full, who follows God fully. How could I do that? And we talked about that. I tell them some of the things that I'm doing. And then I ask, how could, how could I help you? If you were in his position, what is it that would be meaningful to you that would help you to fully follow the Lord? Because one of the things that could have happened is Aaron could have helped Moses. But Aaron gets involved in this just as much as Moses. And, and uh, this struggle that these men have, it's a serious struggle. And this is a lesson that needs to be taken to heart by every member of the class. And that is this. God requires the leaders of his people. And I, I might just change that to say God requires his people to follow him fully. There's blessings in that. There's burdens in not doing that. You see the importance of this lesson. And thank you for struggling with it. Thank you for praying over it. Thank you for praying for your members in light of this. Thank you for asking God to empower you to teach this. You just never know what the Holy Spirit will use in these lessons as you teach God's magnificent word. God bless you for doing that.